Good afternoon. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about something that's dear to my heart, uh, writing beautiful code. Uh, <coughs> so uh, before I start, let me introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Anand. Uh, <coughs> I uh, teach Python professionally. I conduct advanced programming courses at People Academy. I'm also uh, a uh, co-founder of a startup Roro called Roro Data. We're building a data science platform there. So I use Python heavily at my work and also teach whatever I learn to uh, uh, students. So <clears throat> let me uh, start with a quote from uh, Christopher Alexander, who coined the term the pattern language. So it's really hard to say what is beautiful. Have you ever looked at a code and actually felt, wow, this really looks awesome? Okay, have you ever felt? Raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but it's, re uh, uh, it's really hard to say uh, when a code is, what a code is beautiful, what makes a code beautiful, okay? So it's kind of, some people say it's, uh, Alexander, Christopher Alexander says it's the quality without a name. So uh, you look at it, you kind of feel it, uh, but it's very hard to say. So he talks in the context of uh, architecture, but applies to uh, many other uh, art forms as well, if you consider programming is also an art. <laughs> so uh, let me quote uh, uh, this from, uh, the, it's called the Wizard Book. Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. This is programs must be written for people to read and only instantly for machines to execute. It's a profound statement because uh, usually we think programs are written to just get some job done. Okay, <clears throat> so we write for a computer to execute something. But uh, if you look at it deeply, uh, programs must be for written for people. The reason is, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the life cycle of any typical computer program, write once, first time, for the computer, for the, for the for the remaining duration of the lifetime of the program, sometime, I mean, someone else look at the program after some time, he has to understand that code. Or, uh, a lot of times what happens is we write a code and after a week or two, uh, we just can't make sense of that program. I'm sure like all of us went through that phase, okay. So it's very important to write programs to keep in mind of the, uh, the people who are going to read the code at a later point. So we should always try to improve the readability of the programs. So, uh, <clears throat> Let me start with the very simple low-hanging fruit that everyone knows that uh, you have to do it, but uh, not many people do this. Okay, choosing meaningful variable names. It's so important that uh, even people with a lot of experience fail to uh, pay attention to this. Uh, I teach Python professionally. Uh, I do Python, advanced Python courses to uh, working professionals. Uh, so I really find it frustrating when uh, people with like three, four years of program experience and I can't even pick right variable name. It's not that they can't pick, but it's just that we don't just pay the attention to those details. Uh, I'm going to sh show you with a couple of examples how important it is to pick a variable, right variable name. <clears throat> so uh, let me quote uh, uh, Phil Caltron on uh, that two hard things in computer science are cache invalidation and naming things. Believe me, naming things is not easy. It's hard. What's the longest time you have spent banging your head to figure out what name to give to a class or a file name or a variable. I remember having, spending literally two full days to figure out what should I name this thing, what I'm trying to implement. Okay, so uh, naming things takes time and you should give that time, okay. It's very, very important to give that. So the first uh, tip is avoid generic names. They really don't make sense. If you want to, uh, uh, so what we do is we want to have temporary variable, temp, temp to manage your data. It's kind of, it's two generic names. You really uh, can't understand what they mean. You have to use uh, a little more uh, specific names, for example. Uh, yeah, so uh, you should use a little more specific names to the context what that means. The other thing is, uh, hope you can see the colors. Yeah. So the red uh, is to indicate uh, not so nice code, and the green is the one which is uh, uh, what's, uh, what I'm suggesting. So avoid using abbreviations. Uh, people say UCF, uppercase formatter, but doesn't, it's, people can't understand what UCF is. It's okay if you're saying HTTP or SMTP because that's a well understood acronym, so that's fine. Uh, but uh, using something like BA for a bank account doesn't make sense, okay? It's very hard to understand. You can probably say formatter or an account or something. So uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a, uh, I think a good uh, thumb rule. Uh, don't use abbreviations unless that's a very common uh, thing that, uh, Everyone knows. <clears throat> uh, this is another uh, uh, common mistake that I keep finding in people is uh, they use a, a data type as a name of the variable. They say it's a list. They say it's a string. Okay, but list of what? 
stink holding what, right? So it's better to say uh, actually what it says. It says sum of numbers, count words. It takes a string, but actually a sentence. It's not a paragraph. It's not a file name. So uh, it's, it's better to say specifically what it actually uh, means, not just saying the type of it. So that makes it a lot more readable. <clears throat> the other uh, thumb rule about uh, nouns and verbs is uh, to use nouns for variables and classes, uh, saying concepts, and use verbs for functions, so saying actions. So these are the tasks that you want to do. So size, price, task, scheduler, etc. they uh, go well for uh, variables and classes. And use actions, get file name. Instead of just saying a function as file name, say get file name, so that it kind of indicates you're doing an action, or make account, or deposit. So these are the kind of uh, examples where uh, using webs makes sense for uh, functions. And, uh, okay, these are not, uh, uh, it's very simple rules, not something that I've invented. These are the age old wisdom that's been talked about from so many people. If you uh, find out practice of programming, or there's so many other books people have written, but I'm just trying to take that wisdom and uh, put in the context of Python. So if you look at, uh, if you have a list of values, it's good to uh, use a plural for that. So uh, say a largest line of lines, or uh, always sort listed directory, and you get files there. But uh, look at the other uh, example. So file equal to always sort listed directory. It's not a file, it's a list of files. So it's better to use a plural to uh, say that it's actually a list of values. And this, these are examples actually, uh, uh, real world examples have uh, found from uh, people when I'm doing teaching. Uh, okay. So people say for lines in open file name read lines. Reading read lines gives you a list of lines. But each element is a single line, not lines. So, uh, and saying int of lines doesn't make sense at all, right? So uh, it's better to uh, use plural for a list. And, uh, <coughs> When you're using loop indices, uh, uh, <coughs> reserve i and j for loop uh, indexes only, not for the values, okay? For example, uh, for i in range 10, it's fine. i is an index, you're going over uh, its value 0 to 10. But if you're going over a list of values, using i doesn't make sense, because i is usually used for an index. And uh, if you're using i for numbers, that feels like it's a single integer, but n could be a number, or it could be a string or anything, right? So use something which is more uh, conveys what it actually holds. For any numbers, probably more, makes a lot more sense. You might be thinking like, why am I talking about silly things? Right? These are things what everyone knows, but it's really, really hard to get this in practice. Okay, let me show you an example. This is a small file in function I've written. Okay, can you try and understand what this is doing? Can someone, let's take a minute and then see what this does. Can someone explain to me what this function does? Wow, awesome. Yeah, it actually, that's what it does, okay. But let's look at this, okay. So, if you look at uh, the same function I've written like that, okay, all I've done is I've changed the names. I've not changed any structure of the program. So, uh, <laughs> it's just a file in program, and it's really hard to understand what is doing X and Y, and you're adding things to Z, okay. So, by changing the names, it made so much of a difference, okay. Now, by looking at immediately, you know that it's a data set, it's an index, and you're taking a row, and then from the row you're taking, yes. I know, I know, but the thing is I'm talking about, uh, <coughs> I agree, so I picked this example because uh, 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 to show how much difference uh, names makes, I agree, you can use the list comprehension, but uh, just uh, trying to show how much names makes sense, okay. So, uh, if a file line code can make so much of a difference in picking the right variable names, Imagine what would happen if, if you're working with the final line program or 10,000 line program, right? So uh, uh, it's really, really important to pick the right uh, names. So the other uh, uh, thing is uh, when you're using similar names for completely different data types, it's kind of very confusing. So when you're writing code, uh, you should also keep in mind what people think uh, unconsciously, okay. So when you see uh, names which are sounding similar, we unconsciously expect that they actually hold similar type of values. Say A1 and A2, 
I think they must be the same kind of values. But if you put a list in one other integer, that's very, very confusing. It's very hard to uh, 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 make sense of that. So probably say values are n instead of saying a1 and a2. And that's, that's one of the issues that we had in the previous uh, example as well. We say x and y, kind of feels like x and y must be the same types. Maybe both are lists or both are integers or something, but they're not. Okay. <clears throat> now let's uh, look at comments. We all say people, uh, we all say writing comments is good, but uh, is it really? I mean, there's really no need to say the obvious, okay, uh, <clears throat> increment x by 2, but it's okay. I mean, I mean we're Python programmers, we look at the Python code and figure out the incrementing x by 2. But uh, that's just, that's the obvious thing. There's no right, need to write a comment. But you can actually explain why you're doing it. Compensate for border on both sides. So you're adding one pixel on both sides, so you're adding two. So that makes more sense. You're conveying why you're doing that. So uh, don't say the obvious, say why you're doing that. And a lot of times it makes a lot of sense when you're commenting, uh, uh, <coughs> add a uh, comment to explain why you made the choice. So the following is an optimization saves a lot of uh, memcache calls. So I'm saying that this is the reason why the following code uh, is being uh, done this way. <coughs> and also it's a good to document special cases. For example, uh, you figured out there's an Unicode error happening and you don't know why what's happening and this magically fixes that issue. Okay, so uh, uh, put a timestamp and say, this is a special case uh, and this is how I'm fixing it. So in future, people will be careful when they're touching that part of code. <clears throat> and it's actually uh, uh, good if you can actually make comments redundant. Okay, you can write code such a way that you don't really need to write comments. For example, if you look at the first case, uh, the find length of the longest line. So there's a list comprehension and finding the max of that, okay. Uh, instead of that, if you say, n equal length of longest lines, you don't really have to comment that. It's kind of it's, uh, very clear in the program uh, itself. So you can write self-documented code. So uh, the code is simple enough for people to understand by the uh, code itself. You don't have to write the documentation. So that's something uh, uh, really awesome if you could uh, do that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the other thing is uh, if you have longer functions, what we typically do is you have stage one, stage two, add a block comment, say that this is what, uh, so process documents and upload them to search engine, and there's a part of code. But uh, it makes uh, more sense to split that into smaller functions, and then say docs equal to process documents, and then search and submit to search engine. So you don't really need comments to explain that part of code. <clears throat> now that we have looked at uh, uh, the uh, simple things, uh, or more accessible things like variable names, and uh, comments, let's look at uh, program organization. So how do you structure your program? Uh, so divide and conquer. So split your program into smaller independent modules and functions. Uh, that way it's a lot easier for people to uh, make sense of that. Let me uh, uh, quote uh, uh, Miller's law. What it says is, the number of objects the average human can hold in working memory is seven plus or minus two. It's a prof it has profound implications on uh, uh, how we should write our code. The reason is, seven plus or minus two is the number of things that you can hold in your head. That means, that probably means when you're writing a function, you should not have more lines than that. Or you have a class, then the number of methods that in your public API should not be more than that. So when someone looks at your class and then uh, starts working on it, starts using it, if it has seven plus or two minus functions, then you'll be able to kind of keep all of it in his a working memory and then able to work with it. But if it has a lot of them, it's pretty difficult. So that's a kind of ballpark figure to keep in mind when you're writing uh, uh, <coughs> classes or functions. So I think that's a good number to keep the size of a function as well. And <coughs> the uh, other common thing people always I mean, don't pay attention as uh, is duplication. <coughs> so duplication is bad. Uh, so for example, uh, it's a function, it takes an input data and tries to uh, uh, convert that to an integer and then sums them up and give the value back. Okay. So, uh, since let's say, uh, data is coming from users, we want to do some uh, uh, validation and converting to integer before we actually do the summing up. So there's a uh, try and accept, but we're doing it twice. If you see actually a deliberately added in, uh, uh, so just people we write one thing and then copy paste and then modify things. And uh, uh, you see that kind of uh, deliberately left X here because that's, uh, that's kind of errors that we usually get into. Okay, so uh, instead of duplicating, we should, it's a lot better if we can actually generalize that. 
say uh, uh, you get int, take input data, and then uh, x and y, and uh, you return x and y. So if you look at the add function here, it's very easy to understand now than uh, what we had before. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> we should also avoid uh, too many nested levels when you have a function. Uh, it may have, so we may end up like writing code like this. Uh, uh, it's updating a blog post. So there are many cases where you want to update a blog post. You want to update a title or a tag. So there's a big function that kind of uh, going over the steps. But if you see that too many levels of, uh, uh, too many nested levels here. So that's kind of hard to understand. So what can be done is uh, we can uh, take each part of that and then make that into a separate function that really makes it a lot more readable. Okay. So if you look at this function, this function is just delegating it to uh, other sub-functions. So if you look at this function, it's easy to understand. And if you want the further details, you can look at each of these uh, other functions. <coughs> the uh, other uh, useful thing is to make sure you handle errors separately. For example, this function is trying to uh, get a user from given the uh, email address. So if I check it's a valid user or not, if it's a valid user, just make sure the account is not blocked. And then you query the database and give the user back. But if you see the code of the function, the main function of, uh, of this, uh, pro, uh, this function is hidden uh, in two levels deep. Uh, okay, so the query, so the, the, the database querying is the, is the core of the function, but that's uh, hidden deep inside uh, um, uh, <coughs> so many conditions. Okay, so would it be, wouldn't it be better that to be the most prominent part of the function? So what you can do is you can keep the errors handling uh, separate, for example, like this. So you, have, you do the error validation first, and then uh, <coughs> in the top level, you have uh, the code of the functionality. So you get a query, and then uh, query the database, get the results. And if you're really trying to understand this function, you could just skip the error validation, and then directly jump to uh, the main part of the function, which is uh, not so straightforward if you're uh, uh, doing it like this. Now, the other uh, uh, very important thing is uh, we should try to suppress implementation detail as much as possible. The reason is when someone is trying to understand program, uh, the intent, the what of what the program is doing and how the program is are doing are two different things. So when someone comes to uh, your program, he is, is more interested to understand what the program is doing, right? So uh, we should implement, we should suppress implementation details as much as possible so that you can understand. Uh, 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 the intent of the program pretty uh, quickly, quickly. And then if required, you can go and then see what uh, each of these functions are doing. For example, this program takes one command line argument, which is a file name, and then reads all the words in the file, computes the frequency of the words, and prints the frequency. This is what the program is doing. So it has four lines, and this, this is all the program is doing. So the intent, what the program is doing, is very clear by looking at this program. Okay, But if write a longer function and then put in uh, how the words are read and how word frequency is computed right here in the same function, it becomes too difficult to understand why someone is doing it. Now, you know, they're reading word frequency, uh, computing word frequency, I can go to word frequency function and figure out uh, how it's actually being done. The implementation, uh, the implementation and the intent can actually be separated. The how and what, it's good to separate those two things uh, 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 together. So now, that's, I think, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, this, the things that I want to mention about that are writing beautiful code. And this is a quick summary of what I've covered so far. Uh, so choose meaningful variable names. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is. Uh, it sometimes it takes a lot of time, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's worth spending the time because uh, uh, the amount of time we spend later trying to figure out why the program is written like that or trying to figure out how, how it's actually working uh, uh, is a lot more if you don't spend enough time uh, early to pick right variable names. And use comments when required, uh, but don't put comments just because you have to. <coughs> Split the program into small independent modules and functions. <coughs> Avoid duplication uh, at all costs. Suppress implementation details and always optimize for readability. Let me stop with a quote from Tower of Programming. Uh, <coughs> a program should be light and agile. Its subroutines connected like a string of pearls. So <coughs> talking about the elegance of the program. Uh, the spirit and intent of the uh, program should be retained throughout. You should have very, the clarity of, that you should have in the program. 
There should neither be too little nor too much, neither needless loops nor, nor useless variables, neither lack of structure nor overall rigidity. And also, you need to have the right balance in the program to make it uh, beautiful. Happy coding, and I'm open for questions. The slides of the talk are uh, on my Twitter feed, if you can find out, if you want to follow that. Okay, I'm open any for questions? questions, if you have uh, any. Please, uh, wait for the mic. Yep. Hi, um, so when you talked about the number of objects that the human brain can track, uh, what's your opinion on the sort of recommended maximum minimum length of a code block? Sorry? Like the, the, the sort of recommended length of a code block, so there's there's a school of thought that says if a code block is larger than n lines, it becomes hard to read where n is said to be any number between 40 yeah, and So I, I think uh, thumb rule is it shouldn't be more than uh, half a page of sheets, I think is what people say. But uh, uh, I would say, I mean, my usual recommendation is not more than uh, uh, 10 lines is what maximum I would say for a function. So I would say like the 7 plus or minus 2 rule it works for a number of lines in a function. What are your thoughts on code formatters like YAPF? Sorry, could you please repeat? I couldn't. What are your thoughts on code formatting tools like YAPF? Uh, so, uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, I think you let me repeat. So, you're talking about the Go Format tool, right? Yeah, I think it's a really good tool. Uh, uh, I think it's called the, the bike share discussions, right? Should they use uh, one space or two space or put a space before or after? I think we just, uh, uh, get used to whatever it is, and I think Go format Go has really done very good uh, thing about uh, having you don't have options; you have just follow just one formatting thing. But I don't think we have uh, that luxury in Python. Though there's Pepe, uh, it's up to the people to decide whether to follow or not. I think it, I, I would really allow to have something like that for Python. So just a quick question on your thoughts on uh, something more specific about intelligible variable names. Uh, I, I agree with most of what you said. I think it's great. I just wondered about this habit of deleting all the vowels in variable names, like trying to, like picking a name and then abbreviating it by deleting all the vowels. Like, I hate this. What do you think about it, this practice? Oh, sorry, I didn't get. Could you please repeat the question? So, sorry, yeah, so this kind of habit of deleting all the vowels and variable names once you've chosen a name that, uh, to try and make it shorter, like some, I guess there's a trade off between variable length and intelligibility. <coughs> yes, uh, so I think it's, it's an important uh, point. So uh, I would say the variable, uh, the length of the variable should be proportion, can be proportional to the scope of it is, okay? So for example, if it's a local variable, if you have a function which is five, six lines, it doesn't make, it's probably okay to have a single letter variable. But whereas if you have a global variable, uh, which the scope is much larger, it's better to be verbose and have the full name. Uh, <coughs> so if it's just a small function or inside a for loop, uh, I would say for W in words, uh, W kind of indicates it's a part of a, uh, it's an element of words, so that's a single word. So that's probably okay to have a single letter. But I don't really like, uh, to uh, take out ovals or kind of make it uh, 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 short just to, uh, 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 I think readability is more important than the length of a variable. That's what I would say. Okay, any more questions? Uh, thank you, Anand. In your opinion, what is a good time to clean up your code when programming? Uh, I would say, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, it's a uh, habit that you have to build over time. Okay, so uh, uh, once we start keeping these things in mind when you're writing code or looking at someone's code, we kind of feel that, hey, it's kind of violating that principle. Okay, so we should start getting that sense of uh, uh, identifying that bad smells so that when you're writing your code, you don't actually write that kind of things. Uh, so, uh, I mean, probably when you're beginning, you. Uh, for a beginner, it probably takes a while to get that habit, so you'll write it and then clean up. But uh, once you get through that, go through that habit, you'll probably uh, start uh, getting that sense. Uh, it kind of becomes your habit, I believe. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. So thanks a lot, Anand. Thanks.